TEDx. Today, I want to take you on a journey. I want to take you on a journey out of this air-conditioned auditorium. I want to take you away from this beautiful city of San Diego, away from your lives that every one of you know, your highest rised buildings that you work in, your offices, your double-storied homes with your SUVs and your shopping malls. I want to take you away from our obsession with the digital world, our computers, our iPads, our iPhones, and our obsession with time. And I want to transport you to a place, a place where time does not exist. I don't even know if you can imagine that. Imagine a world where there's no time. If there's no time, there is no need to measure age. If there's no time, there's no need to rush. There's no need to worry about tomorrow. I want you to imagine a world, if at all possible, where you don't have any possessions. You purely exist as a family unit. If there are no possessions, there's no need for police, there's no need for jails. If you exist as a family unit, there is no need to have leaders. Now I can see some of you in the audience smiling. Wow, then there's no need for politicians, yes true. But it's hard for us to even imagine that such a world exists or existed. I would like to tell you that we all lived in such a world. Well, our ancestors lived in such a world. And yes, such a world still exists today. It's a very small world, but we will find it on the other side of the world. In this world, people don't live by time. In this world, the women go out and hunt and gather and look after the children. The men will prepare traps or they will go and hunt for meat. The children will laugh and sing and play. And the most amazing thing is at the end of the day, these people that are at one with nature will come together as their family unit and sit around the fire and they will sing and laugh and dance and heal. But they will do one thing that we are forgetting to do in our digitized world. They will talk. They will actually talk to each other. And now I would like to introduce you to these people. These people come from a place called the Kalahari. The Kalahari is a desert in southern Africa. And its name is a Tsetswana word that means a place without water. I'd like to introduce you to the Kalahari Bushmen. here at Norma, northeastern part of Namibia in the Kalahari Desert, and here is a Sutkwasi village. The people in this village represent the Sutkwasi people that have lived here for thousands of years as hunters and gatherers. So why am I interested in the people from the Kalahari? Well, I'm a genomicist. Well, what does that mean? That means I read DNA. I read the letters, the three billion letters of DNA that you inherited from mom, and three billion letters of DNA that you inherited from dad. Why is this important? This is our DNA code. This is the story of who we all were. This is the story of our past. But importantly, this is also the story of our future. Taking blood, looking at the DNA in the blood, to be able to tell the story, the story of us, mankind. This is a gentleman I'd like to introduce you to today. His name is Kobi, and Kobi became, in 2010, the first indigenous person to have his DNA sequenced. That means every single letter of his code that he got from his mom and dad was read. And we did this, and the reason why we did this was because Kobi represents a very, very ancient line and he represents the most diverse 
DNA sequence that we currently have to date. Why is this important? This is an example that I like to use because it is an example that is very important to the Kalahari people. They are very, very much aware of the elephant, um, of around about a six-ton animal. And I can tell you now it's the only animal that they are truly scared of. I know when they've disappeared that there is an elephant around somewhere. And what they don't realize, though, and probably the audience doesn't realize, that around 83 million years ago, the elephant and the animal on the other side, which a lot of you may not recognize, which is a hyrax or a rock rabbit, and the locals call it a dussy, it is those two animals are related. This is about a four-pound animal is related to a six-ton um, elephant. So we can tell this through the DNA code that although people, although creatures may not look alike, they once shared a common ancestor. As humans, everyone walking this planet, we all shared a common ancestor. We shared this common ancestor around 200,000 years ago. Last year, we reached the 7 billion figure. There are 7 billion people walking on this planet. And National Geographic decided to have a look at, at what was the most common face out there on our planet. And that most common face is a 28-year-old Han Chinese male. So if we think of ourselves um, as the Western population, that is the most common face we will see. Or Asians and Europeans migrated out of Africa around 25 to 38,000 years ago. But Ubi represents a line that diverged from this common ancestor around 150,000 years ago. If you look at those two ladies' faces on the picture in front of you, you will say to yourselves, wow, they look so similar. Those are two Kara Kalahari Bushman ladies. They look so similar to us. But I can tell you now that their DNA is more different to each other than a European is from an Asian. So why is it important for us to learn from the Kalahari Bushmen about their DNA sequences? Well, I certainly can't tell you everything today, what there is to learn or what we have learned, but I can give you a little bit of a few examples. The Kalahari Bushmen have adapted very well to their lifestyle. As I said in the beginning, they live in an area that has very, very little rainfall, and the sun shines almost every single day of the year. Some of these ad adaptations include no body hair, no sweating. They also have droopy eyelids to protect their eyes from the sun. They also have adapted the ability to store fat and liquid in their buttocks, and they will use this as storage for the times when there is no food. When you go on a hunt, the hunters will hunt for about three days at a time. They do not carry water with them. They can drink very little water, which they get from the bulbs of the plants. This is enough to sustain them. I would love to see anyone in the audience try to achieve that. But we have also adapted. Our DNA has also adapted over time. The most significant adaptation that has happened was around 10,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, we started agriculture. And because of domestication of plants and animals, our DNA and our code had to adapt to this new lifestyle. And some of these adaptations include our ability to eat grains. The Bushmen do not eat grains, they eat roots. They struggle when they try and eat grains. Another one, for example, we have adapted the ability to drink milk into adulthood. Every single true Kalahari Bushman whose DNA I've looked at has, is lactose intolerant. They have not adapted to drinking milk. But of course, with these domestications have also become diseases, diseases associated with cattle and with livestock. And we have adapted to many of these diseases. Resistance to malaria, for example, is one of the common ones. The Kalahari Bushmen 
are not resistant to these diseases. So I want to take this opportunity to thank the Kalahari Bushmen for what they are teaching us about ourselves, about our past, and most importantly, what they are teaching us as geneticists and genomicists about our future and where we are going. But I also want to heed some caution for, for them as a people who are dwindling. Please remember, our Western life and our Western changes are dramatic to them. So when their lives are dwindling, their regions are dwindling, and we come into their areas, they do not have in their code that resistance that we have built up. Thank you very much.